20 years before the debut of the United Paramount Network in 1995, the studio's effort to launch a second Star Trek series called Phase Two, as well as a new television network, led to Star Trek's leap to the big screen. This journey from the original television series to the first Star Trek film carried the cast and crew as far as their imagination, skill, and special effects technology could take them. Throughout the history of this landmark television and film series, producer-creator Gene Roddenberry nurtured and protected Star Trek with the utmost care. Gene wanted to talk. He wanted to, he wanted to find someone intelligent out there to go ahead and, and talk to. And so he found them, he found the audience, which is something the networks never counted on, that these people could actually you know, have intelligence. He wanted to be a writer, he wanted to get paid for his writing, he wanted to make, be able to make a living at doing only that. And the fact that he wanted a chance to put down his ideas on paper, he knew that he couldn't do it in the era that he was in. Censorship was so bad in those days that if uh, he could take things and switch them around a little bit and maybe paint somebody green and perhaps put weird uh, outfits on them and so forth, that he could get some of his ideas across because they wouldn't hit the censors. The censors weren't in those days really scanning every word, I guess. And so he got a lot of ideas through and that's how Star Trek got born. When it went off the air, we finally pushed him back on uh, and, and, and said, give us a chance in syndication. But we don't have enough in syndication. There's 79 episodes, and you had to have 100. Um, but we went into uh, syndication, and, which was a smart move on Paramount's part by that time. A starship also runs on loyalty to one man, and nothing to replace it. When Star Trek was canceled, there was a strong group of fans, a large group of fans and viewers who were terribly upset. And the, the legend that has grown up about that is that the year Star Trek was canceled was the last year that the networks measured audience simply by numbers. The next year, they started measuring by demographics. That's the point where demographics came in. And then they started to say, aha, okay, if this is going to work out demographically, then maybe we've just got some of the wrong shows that we've been pushing. And the people at NBC looked at uh, the breakdown of the old ratings of Star Trek and said, boy, if we had known all these young adult males were watching back then, we would have never canceled the show. So it wasn't that a group uh, came into being when Star Trek went into syndication. That group had always been there. And when... But suddenly it was the perception of them, who they were, they looked at them as a group, and that all-important 18 to 24 and up, that group was represented by Star Trek in surprising numbers. And they thought, oh, wow, okay, we'll stick it here in the news. It won't get anybody then, and we'll, we'll use this up, and uh, it won't be a problem anymore. It's just going to be one of those shows that has lost that much money. And young adult males weren't too interested in watching the 6 o'clock news, but they were interested in seeing Star Trek, especially since some of the episodes had run as late at 10 o'clock at night. And the kids might have missed it when they were 14, but now that they were 16, 17, 18, mm -hmm. they could see it. Well, sure enough, we put it on at 6 o'clock at night, and the kids are home, and mom's home, and they're doing dishes, or um, they're just starting to eat, and um, that did it right there. I mean, the, the ceiling went up, uh, and everybody in the world started to watch Star Trek. Paramount was not, uh, they realized that Star Trek was very successful. And uh, the frustration they felt was, we had a shot, we missed it, we have this property that's worth a lot. And how do we redevelop it and how do we reconnect? And also they were thinking, and it seems like history is repeating itself, the Paramount network was just about to come into being. At that point, Paramount decided they were going to start a fourth network and Star Trek was going to be, Star Trek Phase Two was going to be the flagship of that network. Um, Harold Livingston was brought in as the, uh, the writing producer. I was hired as the creative producer and Bob Goodwin was the uh, line producer. 
and uh, Gene was the executive producer. Gene was coming back in for Star Trek, um, and the interesting thing about that was that I had spoken to him in the the uh, the months before, and we had talked about Star Trek, and he was really not all that enthusiastic about going back to Star Trek, and that's something that has not necessarily been revealed a whole lot. He was uh, he was feeling like been there, done that. He wanted to move on and prove himself in other areas, um, but of course, when Star Trek came, he took it. He had so many good shows. And he didn't, he never got to think about anything but Star Trek as soon as he would start to grow away from it. And so on, their Paramount would come and they would hit him over the head with it again. And he had started to think of it as, well, I guess it's my baby. Maybe this is what I meant to do. John Pelville was the, uh, he was Gene's uh, assistant. I was both sitting in on story meetings and doing things like getting Gene's car washed. Uh, so, um, the, but Harold found that when I was sitting in on the story meetings that I had a lot to offer, that I could, I had good knowledge of what had been done on Star Trek, I had good knowledge of the characters, and I had good sense of story structure that all, you know, when I contributed in the meetings, he found that the contributions were very valuable. And he, he felt that I was acting like a story editor. I was performing like a story editor. I should be called a story editor and be paid as a story editor. Alan Dean Foster had this, uh, uh, had submitted this story about V'ger, and, uh, which I liked and Gene liked, and uh, we agreed to develop it. And that was in thy image. And uh, it was uh, it was about I don't remember whether it was Voyager in the original presentation, but it was about a satellite that had been launched and disappeared, and uh, and went to a machine planet, wound up at a machine planet where it was sort of adopted, and enhanced and sent back, and. Um, and in the uh, and in the process became something very dangerous that needed to be dealt with. And Foster went off somewhere. I don't know. And uh, I wasn't concerned about that. I wanted to find a writer to do this pilot. And I couldn't. Uh, I finally, finally, I got Bill Norton, who was a pretty well respected writer. He agreed to do it. And two weeks later, he called me and said that he couldn't do it. And now I now had five weeks to go. So I, I, I had no choice, but I, I, I had to go home, close the doors, lay on the floor, and write the thing myself, which I didn't want to do. But I knew I had five weeks to do it. And I was young in those days and uh, had a lot of resiliency. And I wrote the script. Inside Star Trek, we thought it was going to be a series, and then we heard rumors it was going to be a film, and then we heard it was going to be a series again. It went back and forth about four times. And then it would be once a month it was going to be on, and I tell you, it was so confusing, I forget what they were even called by now. So with all the uh, back and forth of Star Trek, is it going to be a movie, is it going to be a big movie, an expensive movie, is it going to be a television series, finally they made the decision we're going to make the Paramount Television Network and Star Trek, the second Star Trek series with uh, Leonard Nimoy, William Shatner, and all the regular cast on that second five-year mission, mm -hmm. we're going to go ahead. They wanted everybody, all the originals back. Uh, they didn't get Leonard, um, and that necessitated the, uh, the creation of a new character to replace Spock. And, uh, and that character was Zahn. My readings seem to indicate some sort of sensor unit attached to each device. My take on the character, which pretty much remained true through all of my exploration of Zahn, what I did get was that he was a full Vulcan, had no human connection, emotional, that Emotions had been outlawed from his planet generationally as a way of stopping wars from occurring. I don't feel an attack is the logical approach at this moment. 
If you will allow me to take further readings, I could. The first screen test that we did for Zahn, they probably brought in as many actors that would fit that physical description of the time. Zahn was like a 23, 24, 25 year old, fresh out of the Vulcan Science Academy, you know, young, engaging sort of a character. And there was a lot of actors that I recognized from a lot of different theaters and actors who had done a lot of other film work. So it was a very competitive day. You could feel it like a football game. Who's gonna throw the pass? Who's gonna catch the pass? And I won. I won that football game. We had the series that had been announced to be the linchpin of the Paramount Television Network. It was the new Star Trek series. They were redesigning the Enterprise, building sets. They were commissioning scripts. They were having meetings. They were figuring out what life was going to be like in the 23rd century and doing what the new communicators would be. production tests of what the engine room would look like, doing makeup tests of what Aaliyah would look like. In August 3rd, 1977, which was less than two months after phase two had been announced. There was a meeting which included Michael Eisner and uh, Bob Goodwin, and Bob Goodwin, Gene Roddenberry, and uh, everyone else involved in the production of the show. And Bob Goodwin pitched to Michael Eisner the story In Thy Image by Alan Dean Foster. And Bob Goodwin says that at that meeting, Michael Eisner heard the story and he slammed his hand down on the table, and he said, gentlemen, we've been looking for a Star Trek motion picture for five years, and this is it. After the stunning success of the first motion picture, Star Trek was firmly established as a tentpole franchise for Paramount and led to a series of popular films. And though Star Trek did return very successfully to the small screen in 1987 with Star Trek The Next Generation, and followed by Star Trek Deep Space Nine in 1993, it would not be until 1995 that the fifth network, UPN, would come together with the premiere of Star Trek Voyager. With Voyager's retirement in 2001, Star Trek's fifth incarnation, Enterprise, was born. Star Trek, continuing to go where no entertainment franchise has gone before.